Now, if you'd said to someone five years ago that you could reverse diabetes, you would have had shouts of incredulity followed by a stiff argument. That's perhaps not where we think now. And to present the results of the direct study, uh, Professor Roy Taylor. Uh, Roy, what have you found and how are you going to finally settle this argument about whether diabetes is reversible or not? Well, I wouldn't see it as an argument. We move on the basis of clear evidence. And the first evidence came about in trying to test the hypothesis I put forward in 2008. And that hypothesis predicted if we embarked on a period of calorie restriction, we would see the processes underlying type 2 diabetes go away and people would return to normal. To my utter astonishment on testing the hypothesis, it proved to be more correct than I could have ever imagined. And we published that in 2011, as you say, to great incredulity. We followed it up with another study looking at how long someone could have diabetes before it would become irreversible. And in the meantime, we started a very large study. Now, this very large study was a randomized trial. It was based in primary care, which of course is where type 2 diabetes is looked after mainly. And the intervention arm, those randomized to intervention, were not treated by specialists. All the specialists did was to train the practice nurses, the ordinary nurses or dietitians in primary care. Eight hours of structured training. Those ordinary nurses achieved just under 15 kilograms of weight loss over the weight loss period in all comers with type 2 diabetes. So you see, this is a highly effective, well-tolerated intervention. And, and in, in a messy real-world situation as well. In a complete real-world world situation. And at one year, the weight loss had been largely sustained. And so by the intention to treat principle, the weight loss was over 10 kilograms at that time. Now, that is greater than any other large randomized trial affecting weight. I'd emphasize the weight because this was nothing to do with exercise. In order to get the weight loss, we asked people not to increase their exercise. Critically important. I should imagine you were quite popular. <laughs> when we say this to our participants, our patients, there's a big smile. It's very popular. And of course, it recognizes the reality. People who have eaten themselves into a state of overweight find it difficult to exercise mm. and are self-selected because they are the people who don't particularly like it. So we're talking about weight loss being induced by diet alone. Of course, when we turn the corner and go into the weight maintenance phase, we encourage increased daily physical activity. But then people can bounce around much more in a lively fashion. And indeed, the commonest comment we got was, I feel 10 years younger. So that was the enthusiasm for the 149 participants in the intervention group. The 149 participants in control had the, all the usual tablets, all the best treatment according to guidelines. Intervention people had all the tablets stopped on day one. And at one year, the intervention group contained 46% of people who no longer had diabetes. They had gone back to non-diabetic levels of HbA1c. So, you see, it's not a, an argument as such. It is a real phenomenon, and it reflects a new understanding of the cause of type 2 diabetes. This is a real ray of hope, and that surprises doctors. It's less surprising to individuals with type 2 diabetes, often who hate the concept of having diabetes and would do anything to get out of it. Now we know the way. So this points to really the treatment of diabetes in the future almost being a social movement. In other words, that it's patients telling other patients, look, you can do this, you can reverse it. I was just like you. Because we often think about physician push, but actually you need patient pull as well, particularly for a problem as intractable and as large as diabetes. That's perfectly true, but I just emphasize there's a particular aspect of patient push, and that's within the family. Because would you send an individual to a dietitian? 
Well, no, individuals don't eat diets. Families eat, often as a group, or couples eat as a group. That's what happens. So it's really important that embarking on this, we're talking about that group. They have to be involved with it. What tends to happen is very interesting. The cupboards are stripped of the crisps and biscuits, and the habit of eating during watching television is no longer there in the family. That helps sustain it. So I think seeing clearly what it is that makes the obesogenic environment so bad, the micro-obesogenic environment of the home, then we can move ahead in a, a sensible fashion. But yes, you're right, that this is medical knowledge applied to social circles. Terrific. Well, a hugely interesting and important uh, piece of work there. That was presented as a poster, and of course you can see all the posters in an electronic version on easd.org.